Welcome to an exceptional edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. I have an anchor from Coindesk TV, an old friend of mine, Christine Lee. Christine told me to buy Bitcoin six years ago when she was a producer at Bloomberg and I didn't listen to her. Now she is an anchor of two different shows on Coindesk TV, First Mover and All About Bitcoin. And she's here to talk to us about Bitcoin's surpassing one trillion market cap. Thank you for coming on, Christine. Alex, it's great to be here. And yes, you, you were part of my journey as well. When I was at Bloomberg, I was researching blockchain technology. I was researching initial coin offerings, which were popping at the time. And, and I was researching um, AI, um, AI, you know, what you do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you came on as my guest. And we've been in touch ever since. And so it's been a remarkable journey to see how the technologies have evolved since then. Yes, it, it really has. It's, I mean, the idea that Bitcoin could be $55,000, $60,000, I would have never dreamed it. 8,000, uh, over 58,300 on Saturday. But it's pulling back substantially right now. Okay. So where is it today, Monday morning? Well, it dropped over 15% to below $50,000 before rebounding somewhat about right now. Let's see. Right now, it's trading at about $53,000. So it's down about 6.8% over the past 24 hours. Something I've always told my students is that the market does move in waves. So sell-offs are a very healthy part of... A lot of volatility in cryptocurrency. It doesn't mean that the end goal is higher or lower. It just means that, you know, if it is going to go up, it's got to go down too on the way. Well, but, we are seeing less volatility in cryptocurrencies as the years move on, but still substantially big upswings, big downswings. So my first question is, do you see Bitcoin as a replacement to gold? Well, I don't know that it will be a replacement as an alternative. Um But we did see recently that Bitcoin was able to take away, while we saw that Bitcoin was rising, uh, gold was actually coming down. And there was this thesis out there that Bitcoin was taking away some of the market share of gold as Bitcoin is viewed as digital gold. And especially among millennials who are just more, you know, live natively in the internet and are very much more comfortable with operating with uh, you know cryptocurrencies, mobile apps that allow you to buy, sell, hold cryptocurrencies, Robinhood. Crypto is just a bit more of an easier onboarding experience for them, something that they get more naturally. And so I think in future generations, we'll, we do see younger people just more comfortable with dealing with Bitcoin. But what about governments deciding that they don't want to have their currency rivaled and outlawing Bitcoin domestically? Do you see that as a, a major bear case? Or what do you see as a major bear case? So, you know, that is uh, illustrated as a bear case with some of the greatest critics of Bitcoin, such as economist Nora Rubini, as well as Peter Schiff. Uh, J- uh, Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan has said that if governments began banning Bitcoin, that could be a huge bear case scenario for Bitcoin. Now, in fact, actually, Michael Burry, who is the you know well-known investor for The Big Short, that film, he was also coming out uh, recently tweeting about, you know, prepare for inflation. And in this kind of environment, governments will likely, you know, go after, attack Bitcoin or even gold in order to, you know, emphasize use of their own, of their own digital uh, rather, government fiat uh, money. That's so, w- I, I, wor- I wonder though if going after something will only make it more sought after. The way the father tells the daughter that he must avoid right? this boy, and then all of a sudden, you know, for- forbidden love, of course, as we all know, can be the most uh, tempting. So, so that's behind the the community of Bitcoin. It- it's this libertarian community in its origin, at least, and they've always seen Bitcoin as a government alternative and that you know governments around the world can try to restrict bitcoin but what does that actually they can't ban it they, i mean it's funny on our show we we talked to 
SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce, and I asked her, well, you know, is there a case, a scenario where the government, the U.S. government could possibly ban Bitcoin? And she said, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> because many governments, they can restrict use of Bitcoin, but Bitcoin can't be banned like the internet can't be entirely banned. I mean, how close are we to having Bitcoin wallets hooked up to a Visa card? So you use your Bitcoin and Visa takes your, your Bitcoin. You know. Yeah. Well, MasterCard uh, a week or two ago just announced that they're looking into developing technology that will allow you to trade or rather spend Bitcoin cryptocurrencies on one of their cards. They're trying to build that technology right now and hook you up with their thousands of merchants and partnerships that they already have in the MasterCard, um, you know, pipeline. So that's a remarkable uh, new development that we've just seen in the past few weeks. Just more corporations, more banks, more financial institutions saying that they want to onboard and use crypto or find out how they can help customers to are you know want to use this technology that is in high demand and how to onboard and implement it in their uh, company and clientele. So the Winklevoss twins told me that there's never actually been a case where Bitcoin has been stolen from one account. Uh, do you agree with that? So the technology is unhackable, okay? Um, you can't, I mean, it, it, the technology itself solves the, the idea of this double spend problem where, this is, you know, this, let me rewind this really far back. When, when the internet came to be, uh, the immediate problem, uh, or, you know, one of the problems they wanted to solve was how do we make e-commerce work? And while having a, a native currency in the internet would have been ideal, it was, it was just hard and they couldn't figure it out. And it was easier to use the existing payment system, the existing financial system and use that. So we wanted to make eBay work, Amazon. And so it was just easier to make electronic payments based on our current financial system work online. And so that's what we have today. We have an electronic system, but it isn't really, you know, native to the internet. It's basically front end processors, back end processors. You're you're buying something, and it's taking actually days to settle. It, you know, you usually see that pending uh, sign when you make a credit card purchase. It's going through all these process. Uh, you know, front end, back end, settlement systems in the in the very uh, complicated settlement process we have in our financial system now. Um, but the idea of developing digital currency that was native in the internet that I could just trade from me to you instantaneously, that, that had been in development, but it hadn't been adopted or you know figured out in the sense like how do we you know with some of the problems was how do we solve this double spend problem that if i make a digital currency how do i make sure that someone else some bad actor isn't duplicating it or trying to you know mess with the system and the transactions and the whole ledger and so to your question whether or not there's no one that can do that with Bitcoin. They figured it out. It was a peer to peer or, you know, had peer to peer characteristics. Um, we, there, there's a whole network of people running the blockchain software. Couldn't criminals and, create fake peers though? And then fake peers take capital from one real person and then distribute it to like a thousand other fake peers. That's my worry with blockchain, I guess, is just the dissemination of fake users by hackers. And, but I mean, but are you trying to, because you can't, you can't have that double spend problem on Bitcoin because everyone running the Bitcoin software is basically confirming transactions and running the ledger. And, you know, there's a consensus among that. So there's no, I mean, if you want to write that you stole someone's Bitcoin, I mean, it would be, it would that that transaction would be locked up because it would not 
I think we need to take a step back though and realize that there's going to be criminal actors in all walks of life, as there always have been in all of human existence. So, you know, what Bitcoin offers really at the end of the day seems to be a more kind of globally centralized as opposed to, you know, government centralized, uh, you know, asset capital structure for payments. And so that's, I, I, that, I feel like that has to be the globally, end goal for Bitcoin. So what, what, what do you, a globally centralized, that's essentially decentralized because it's- Oh, no, exactly. Decentralized finance is globally centralized. And so, we, you know, we have a non-government non non networks of you know, payment structure. And so once Bitcoin is there, how high do you think Bitcoin price can go? I mean, if, you know, half the world in 20 years is using Bitcoin as their preferred, you know, payment denominator. Will Bitcoin hit the four hundred thousand that the Winklevi speculate on, or do you think it could be even higher? Oh, I mean, well, there's a lot of speculation out there. I'm not, I, I'm not an investment advisor. I, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, where no, could it, I, mean, I mean, I've heard one million dollar projections. Yes, I think yes, yeah, some some notable person did come up with a million dollar projection. Yeah. Know. It really has to do with the community and with um, who's using this and, and what is it being used It for. really is all about the evolution of the community. Yes, without yeah. a doubt. It's all about what percentage of the world embraces this. And I'll exactly. tell you from from perspective of being a teacher, I mean, nearly 150 students, their preoccupation with Bitcoin is immense. Their interesting goal is almost zero. So I can't not see continual movement in the younger generations of the world embracing Bitcoin over gold, which would imply that the price will keep rising. I don't own any Bitcoin, but as an analyst, I'm not saying it won't you know, come in by half or who knows what, but it does seem to be more and more embraced by society. The, the trend does seem to be upwards. Well, that's certainly what we've been seeing in the past couple of weeks, especially. Yeah. I, I mean, just a, two weeks ago, Tesla announced that they were buying one and a half billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. So they were converting their cash into Bitcoin. And this is a trend we're seeing among public companies, most notably uh, MicroStrategy. Yes, MicroStrategy, of course. Intelligence firm. Yeah, their uh, CEO, Michael Saylor, has been a Bitcoin advocate since COVID, basically. And it just has been converting their corporate treasuries to Bitcoin. And he's been kind of on this religious like, <laughs> uh, you know, tear on uh, buying more Bitcoin and encouraging other corporations to do the same. But when you think about the dilution that is occurring of the U.S. dollar, one can understand why people are looking for alternative you know, assets because it's amazing how many dollars we are printing as a nation. It's really right. just absolutely startling. Right. And so that has been one of the arguments for why we're seeing this run up right now. It's just a confluence of all these factors that are a bull case for Bitcoin. So a, a very, you know, right now, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is talking about and supporting the Biden administration's push for $1.9 trillion in stimulus. Yeah. And, you know, what will... What will the largest happen? infrastructure package ever, you know, since World War II. Yeah. And there's a lot of concern. Well, what kind of inflationary environment will that introduce uh, to the economy? And, you know, a lot of corporations, a lot of people are thinking about what am I going to do with my dollars as they see the sinking value of their bank accounts uh, declining because of these pressures. And so in the case of MicroStrategy, in the case of Tesla, they've seen that, well, for them, the dollar's poison. And so they need to put it in some sort of, you know, de-risk their treasuries in some way. And some are turning to Bitcoin to do that. So my last question, but I'm one of you, thank you so much for coming on, Christine, is about GameStop. Do you see a correlation there? Well, what we saw with GameStop was very fascinating in terms of a confluence, a convergence between Wall Street, uh, retail investors, and the whole internet culture. And we saw that, you know, converge in real time, and it was very fascinating to watch. We saw that, um, you know, with the GameStop phenomenon, people 
on subreddits were able to drive this stock up oh. and have a short squeeze. And that spillover effect had an impact on cryptocurrencies, which is very much based in meme culture, which is very much based in the internet culture. And so we saw Dogecoin, which is basically a joke coin. It was made... Oh. The cryptocurrency made as a joke skyrocket and we also saw various other cryptocurrencies also rise as well and i think what we learned from that at least is that these communities drive markets and we see that in all aspects of life right now in terms of politics the populism we've seen in the latest election cycle as well as now we're seeing it in the markets that communities are able to organize and make substantial you know influence and movements in the market so we saw that with GameStop certainly will the global community repossess <laughs> their financial systems with Bitcoin this was a wonderful talk Christine please stay safe during these crazy times absolutely thanks Alex yeah. and thank you so much for coming